Hey everybody and welcome to another JASP tutorial. In this tutorial, we're gonna continue our power analysis module video series, little mini video series here of doing the different power analysis tests in the new power module in JASP. To get the power module in JASP, you need to go ahead and grab 0.17.2 because it is amazing. So that is not 0.17, that's 0.17. 0.2 to get this new module. So let's jump into the power module. We're going to click on that. Okay. And by default, it brings up the independent samples t-test, but this video is on paired samples t-test. Woo. So paired samples t-test is what we're talking about today. All right. So paired sample t-test, uh, if you're doing this, it is because you have uh, a person who is going to have two measurements, right? A before and after, a time one, time two, uh, whatever, right? They're, they're doing both measurements, single person doing both measurements, more power inherently in this kind of design. So you're going to need fewer people to achieve the same effect size than you would in an independent samples t test. Okay. So it's going to look if you if you watch both videos, it's going to look uh, pretty similar, right? We're, 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 we're not changing a lot. We're still using Cohen's D as our effect size measure or delta in this case to be more of a population parameter. We're going to close the plots and data generation because I talked about those in the overview video. So here we're just focusing on the three kinds of calculations between uh, a power within a power analysis, I should say. So sample size, effect size, and power. So just to break it down, sample size is obviously how many people that you want to measure. And when we want to calculate a sample size, we are going to be doing an a priori power analysis before beforehand, before we measure anyone for anything. Okay. But then we'll also talk about how to calculate power and as well as calculate effect size in this video to show you that the four things, including the type one error weight alpha, these four things work together purposefully, right? They, they tell you everything you need to know about, uh, me, you know, mean differences and things like that within uh, the statistic of T. So we've got that. So we're going to do an a priori power analysis. We're going to do a post hoc power analysis by calculating our power. And then we're going to do an effect size calculation, which is great because it's just a quick effect size calculator. Now, I'm not entirely sure what calculation goes into the effect size for uh, a paired samples T. You cannot use a independent samples T Cohen's D calculation formula, if you will, for a paired samples T. You have to use a slightly different calculation or use another effect size like Hedges G, which is very similar to D in that case. But it takes into consideration the um, aspect of these being paired measurements rather than in fully independent measurements. So anyways. All right. So in our in our uh, example here, right, the values that get given to you once you select paired samples is just going to give you a small breakdown, right? So minimum of effect size of, of interest is 0.5. This is a medium effect, according to Cohen. 0.2 is small and 0.8 is large. So um, if you were to uh, put in here that you wanted to search for a 0.5 effect size with 90% power or a 10% type 2 error rate, okay, because that's what beta means, and then our trust and, trusty tried and true alpha of 0.05 two-sided test, then you need a sample size of 44, okay? So let, let me show you what happens when we change this from 0.5 to 0.2, okay? Still with a, a power of 0.9. It jumps up from 44 to 265 people. 265 people. That's a lot of people, right? Sometimes that might not be feasible. So what we're gonna change now is the alpha, or excuse me, not the alpha, the, the uh, power, the one minus beta. We're not gonna change alpha. Alpha stays at 0.05. I don't recommend changing that at all because 0.05 has become the standard. Uh, it, while there's no real rule, it's become the standard in uh, uh, null hypothesis statistical testing, which is what we're doing here, right? So let's change this. Maybe we don't need as much. Maybe we're okay with uh, an additional 10% of missing the effect in our type two error, which is fine. We're gonna go with the conventional, the historical 0.8 power, which is a little bit more feasible. So watch this number over here, change from 265 to something. Put in the comments below. Is it gonna go higher? Is it gonna go lower? 199. 199 is what we need now. Now that's much bigger than 44, of course, because we're looking for a much smaller effect. The reason why we look for small effects is because they're harder to find than big effects. Big effects are easy to find. We don't need a lot of people to find a big effect, right? So what we want to look for are small effects, like needles and haystacks, that kind of thing. And so how many people do we need to search through this big old haystack to find the needle? Well, the bigger the haystack, the more people you need to search through it. Such a good analogy, right? So the more people you need to look for small effects. Big effects, a handful of hay, right, with a needle in it, you could probably do that yourself. So the idea here is that if we're okay with potentially not finding the needle a little bit more, then we need fewer people. And the possibility of not finding the effect is 0.2, right? Now, with 199 people, I actually end up with a power value that is slightly larger than 0.08, because remember 0.08, uh, excuse me, 0.8, not 0.08, 0.8 
is our minimum value. So if maybe we put in, uh, maybe we ended up only with 195. Oops, we don't want dictation. <laughs> uh, we only ended, ended up with 195. Well, is our power going to be 0.8? Probably not, okay? So uh, the rest of this information is pretty helpful to read through. I go through it completely in my overview video. So take a look at that if you want more information about what these uh, curves and contours are showing you. But <clears throat> really the only thing you need to focus on is this chart up here. Okay. So what if we already collected our paired sample t-test data and we kind of want to know what power we achieved by doing so? We didn't do a power anal an a priori power analysis, so we just measured people and we ended up measuring about 100, okay? So let's go to this, I want to calculate power, so we're going to click on that and let's say we achieved an effect of 0.25, oh, 0 .2, 2, 5, 2, 5, there we go, 0 0.25, okay? And we ended up with, we, only had, we were only able to measure 100 people, okay? What was our power? Well, it was 0.697. And the reason is because we didn't get 199. We got a slightly larger effect than what we were looking for. Maybe we knew that, maybe we didn't know that coming in, but that's what we calculated uh, in our statistical analysis. So we ended up with a 0.25. And so, you know, it's a small effect, of course. That's only a quarter standard deviation uh, difference between the two means. But our power is just about 0.7. So we detected an effect, and that's great. But if we were going to try to do this again with only 100 people, we may miss it because we have a 30 percent chance of missing it now. So we don't want to do that in case our effect size range is actually smaller than 0.25, right? So here we go. If delta is or Cohen's D is less than 0.2, right, then our power is going to be 50 50. We're either going to detect it or not, which is a likely miss. OK, so that is if we were to try to replicate this, right? So our power is only 0.7. We did not reach that lovely part of uh, 0.8. OK, now the last one I want to do for this video is to calculate our effect size. Now, there are a dime a dozen effect size calculators everywhere, right? And I don't really recommend using the power module to uh, do an, a, be an effect size calculator, but it's something to show you that if you've got three of the four pieces of information, then you can find the fourth one, right? Just like you can in algebra. So click on effect size. And if we don't change anything from what I had previously, then you can see that if we had 100 people and um, we ended up achieving 0.8 power somehow, then our effect size is actually 0.28, which is great, right? It's a much bigger than we had anticipated. And so that is, uh, that would be what we would report next to our t-test, our independent sample t-test, okay? Obviously, I recommend using the power analysis module here in JASP for sample size calculation, a priori, how many people do I need? Because this is a great justification than saying, oh, I'm gonna get 30 people per group, or I'm just gonna measure 30 people and, and see what happens, right? Because if I measure just, if I just measure 30 people, Oh, let's go to let's go to not sample size. Sorry, if we go to uh, power and I measure just measure thirty people and I'm looking for a really small effect, to my power, 0.26. Definitely, definitely not going to get it. Definitely going to miss the effect here, right? And then you end up with null results, and you're like, well, why did I end up with null results? The literature says there should be a a difference here, and I'm using a paired samples t test and not an independent samples t test. I should have more power. Blah blah blah. Well, unfortunately, that's not how that works. And so when you're looking for a needle in a haystack and you only got 30 people, and it's a very big haystack, well, then you're probably going to miss it. Everyone's going to get tired and like, I don't want to do this anymore. So yeah, I mean, definitely do a priori power analyses, okay? So that's going to do it for this video. That's how you do a paired samples t-test in the power module in JASP 0.17.2. If you have any comments, questions, suggestions, or other feedback, please leave those in the comments down below. Thank you so much for watching. I'll see you in the next one. Bye.